Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet 3rd Class Carter Margolis. Welcome to the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. It is my privilege to welcome you and our guest speaker, Colonel Retired Lee Van Arzel. Having spent 11 years in the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta Airborne, Colonel Van Arzel has since retired from his 25-year Army career. He served in three combat services holding leadership positions and was decorated for his valor with the Silver Star and Purple Heart for wounds he received in combat. He also was a part of numerous classified operations on a global scale holding leadership positions within these endeavors. Following his impressive military career, Colonel Van Arzel became the Assistant General Manager for National Security Response at the Bechtel Nevada Corporation. He founded a private consulting firm, the Unconventional Solutions Incorporated, and was a founding director of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Institute for Security, for Security Studies. He was the chief executive officer of Triple Canopy Incorporated, an integrated security solutions company, and the chief executive officer of Creative Radicals, a software company. He now serves on the boards of select companies and does volunteer work for veterans organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you Colonel Retired Lee Van Arstel. Hello, everyone. It's an honor for me to be with you here today. I'm looking forward to talking to you. I'm an old soldier, and what old soldiers do is tell war stories. So I'm going to tell you a cool war story today. There's a theme to it. If you look at the Army warrior ethos, it's four simple points. I'll always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit and I will never leave a fallen comrade. I'm gonna focus on that last point, never leave a fallen comrade. And I'll make the argument that even though it's the warrior ethos, these points cover everyday life, not just time and combat. So getting the job done is always crucial. Never quitting, certainly words to live by. Never accept defeat, never accept failure and never leave a fallen comrade. That doesn't just mean someone who's been killed on the battlefield. That means a comrade who may be going through a rough stretch right now. Maybe a comrade who's got a problem with alcohol. Maybe it's a comrade with problems at home or in a relationship. You never leave them. So with that in mind, I wanna tell you about my time as a member of Task Force Ranger, Somalia in 1993 capture General Mohammed Farah ID. So what's going on at this point in time? Somalia is in the midst of a civil war. It has no central government. It's a clan-based society and the clans all have their own well-armed militias. They're fighting for supremacy to see who takes over the country. In the midst of this, the Habergator militia led by General Mohammed Farah ID ambushed and massacred two dozen Pakistani peacekeepers who were there with the United Nations. The United States decided that they had to, had to do something about this. And so Task Force Ranger was formed from the US Army Rangers, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment and the Delta Force, the first Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta. The goal, as I said, very simple and straightforward, kill or capture Muhammad Farah ID. We had no idea where he was after the June 1993 massacre. So we gave ourselves one week to find him. And if in that period of time we didn't know where he was, then we would go to plan B, which was to start to take out his infrastructure. We would capture those people who were important to his success. One of our missions was we took out the radio station that he used to broadcast propaganda and instructions to his troops who are still fighting a civil war. So it was that on the 3rd of October, 1993, we got intelligence that we figured we could act on to capture two of his key lieutenants. This is exactly in line with what we were doing at that point in time, everything to put pressure on him to bring him to the surface. So we conducted a successful mission. In less than 20 minutes, the Delta Force went into a multi-story building multi-building compound after the two key lieutenants, each of whom had approximately a dozen well-armed bodyguards with them. 
And while this was going on, the Rangers fast roped down to four positions to provide external security while the mission was accomplished. At this point in time, I'll show you an overhead image that we have of Mogadishu at that time, just to give you a feel for how dense an urban environment this is. You've got the Delta target area and you've got the four Ranger positions. Now, while this was a textbook mission and was accomplished in less than 20 minutes, the Black Hawk helicopters that had inserted the Rangers were circling the target area, providing sniper support to the task force ranger element that was on the ground. One of these helicopters piloted by Cliff Walcott was shot down. That changed everything. In the words of General Garrison, the task force commander, we just lost the initiative. So now it's incumbent upon us to get the initiative back. We had contingency plans, of course, one of which was a combat search and rescue helicopter with 15 operators on the back of it. We also had a quick reaction force in the form of the U.S. Army 10th Mountain Division, who was in Somalia supporting the United Nations. So the CSAR bird immediately went to the site of the downed helicopter and fast roped down there to get there and provide security before the Somali militia could get there. If the Somali militia could get the, the people on the helicopter and the helicopter itself, that would be a tremendous propaganda coup for them. So we had to get there, not just to prevent that, but to take care of our people. We had the pilot, co-pilot, two crew chiefs and four Delta snipers on board that helicopter. When it crashed, the pilot and co-pilot did everything exactly right to save everyone on board, which they did at the cost of their own lives. The helicopter went down nose first and crushed the pilot and co-pilot, killing them instantaneously. The two crew chiefs and the four snipers all survived. So now it's a race to get there before the militia does. Fortunately, our guys got there first. We were able to secure the site, and that gave time for the 10th Mountain Division, our quick reaction force, to go in. During this, I was the officer in charge of the Joint Operations Center. General Garrison told me when the quick reaction force came to our Joint Operations Center to effect last minute coordination, go with them. Those were his instructions to me. So the quick reaction force went out, ran into a well laid ambush. We had no armored vehicles. Uh, we fought our way out of that, but the commander decided that the best course of action was to return the base, refit, rearm, and try something different. So that's exactly what we did. This time we enlisted the help of Malaysian armored personnel carriers and Pakistani tanks. We went back out again. This time I found myself, rather than riding in the back of a Humvee pickup, standing up leaned over the cab, in the back of a Malaysian armored personnel carrier, Soviet made. I never dreamt that would happen. But it, it was a pretty nice feeling when you could hear the bullets plinking off the side, not even denting it. So our plan was to go to a position, if you remember where the Olympic Hotel was on the overhead imagery that you saw, we went to a position about 400 meters due south of that. At this point in time, we had two down helicopters, one to the northeast, one to the southwest, about equidistant from our stop point. I decided to go with the 10th Mountain Division element that was going to the first crash site because that's where all our people were. By this time, the Ranger security elements and the Delta assault team had moved by foot to help secure the helicopter. I thought that my best position, the, the, the highest and best use for me at this point in time was to prevent any fratricide, no blue on blue. And if you can just put yourself in that city, by this time it's night, there's gunfire, machine gun fire, rifle propelled grenades, fire from the helicopters in support of us coming from the air. It's a dark, noisy, chaotic situation. So the chance for the element that I was with moving into the down helicopter that was secured by the task force ranger personnel, very high for fratricide. So that's what I focused on preventing. I'm very happy to say that we were successful at that. There was not a single instance of that. So, as we moved forward on foot, because we could no longer stay in the vehicles due to the uh, fiery roadblocks, 
we got pinned down from fire by the Olympic Hotel. The company commander told me that uh, he could no longer move forward because the Malaysian armored personnel carriers with us refused to move forward. So this to me was a fairly easy problem to solve. I had Matt Ryerson, one of the Delta operators with me, a proven performer of exceptional abilities, get in the lead APC. I told him to make that go. And I went to the front of the line of the 10th Mountain Division and merely said, let's go. I knew they would follow me. So in that manner, we got to the crash site. I stopped the element short about a block and a half. I was in radio communications with the assault force commander, Scott Miller, who you may recognize that name is now four-star General Scott Miller in charge of all forces in Afghanistan. So we were able to do a face-to-face -face link up and then in place the 10th Mountain Division in a security perimeter without any type of uh, incidents with the, the Rangers and the Delta personnel already on the ground. Now we could focus on getting the pilots and co-pilots bodies out of the helicopter that were trapped inside there. And this is what I was talking to you about earlier about I will never leave a fallen comrade. We had two of our comrades stuck in that helicopter. It would have been very easy and probably the logical thing to do to get everyone picked up and moved out back to the rally point and back to a safe area. But we're Americans, we simply don't do that. We don't leave our people behind. So even though we were taking fire and taking some minor casualties, fortunately we had no further deaths. It took several hours, but we were able to get the pilots and co-pilots bodies out of that crumpled Black Hawk helicopter into one of the Malaysian APCs and then drive back to a safe location. I, I want to stress the point that while every element of the warrior ethos was applicable during that battle, as it is in every battle before and since then. As I said to you initially, I wanted to focus on that last point. I will never leave a fallen comrade. That's critical for the culture of whatever unit you're in. And once you're no longer in the Air Force for whatever business company organization you have to be working with, people have to know that no matter how bad things get, whether it's in combat, whether it's in everyday life, anywhere in between, that they'll never be left behind. For that to happen, that has to be part of the culture. And so I'll leave you with this final thought. Be the person that everyone knows will never leave a fallen comrade. Thanks for your attention. As I said, it's an honor for me to be with you today. And at this time, I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Colonel Van Arsdell, thank you so much for your inspiring words today. We will now begin our question and answer portion of the event. We ask that you ask questions for Colonel Van Arsdell using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I will then present your questions as they come in. Sir, the first question I have for you today is um, Simon Sinek once wrote, um, authority does not mean leadership. How do you make sure that you are being a leader instead of just issuing orders for control in stressful, particularly in combat situations? That, that's a really good question. Uh, hope, hopefully you can hear me now. Do I have a thumbs up on that, Carter? Okay, good. Yeah, there's a huge difference between having the authority to lead, having the position and actually leading. So I was talking to a group earlier today. There's a lot of stress in the business world on being a good manager and almost zero focus on being a good leader. So I'll share with you some of what I consider to be the critical parts of being a good leader. And one of the most important aspects for me is leading from the front, leading from the decisive point. So to do that, everything you do has to be built on a foundation of integrity and two-way trust, everything. That's not negotiable and that's how you live your life. It's not just when you're on the job. You have to always practice clear communications, two-way communications. Get out and be visible. Go out and spend time with the people you're leading, as much time as possible. Don't sequester yourself in an office or behind a desk or somewhere where your subordinates are not. Go out there and be visible. 
You have to be the example. Again, this is how you live your life. It's not just when you're on duty. People are always watching you when you're a leader. You don't just set the example. You don't just say what the standards are and post them on a bulletin board. You are the example. And then you finally have to be the calm in the chaos. If things are at a crisis point, you only add to it when you get excited, yell, bite off subordinates' heads when they bring you bad news. But if you're the calm in that chaos, people will look to you for the answers, for the solution, and to lead them out of that particular crisis situation. So those are the, some of the aspects of leadership important to me, which, as you point out, are very different than simply being in a position of authority. Absolutely, sir. Uh, this next question kind of builds upon that answer. Um, so you just talked about leading from the front a lot and making sure that you're doing everything you can um, to emulate what you believe in uh, at all times and you're always being watched as a leader. Um, however, what is the hardest decision uh, you've had to make to bring someone back, uh, specifically just in combat? I don't think I had any particularly really difficult decisions. I was saved in Somalia from having to make the decision of having healthy live soldiers killed trying to recover dead bodies. That's a horrible calculus for any leader to go through. And at some point in time, you have to say, okay, never leaving a fallen comrade is part of my ethos, but I'm creating more and more fallen comrades the longer that I'm here. And, and you have to do that calculus and hopefully come up with the right answer. I was saved from that in Somalia because we weren't taking any KIAs. We, we, we were still taking fairly steady fire throughout the night. There were some minor injuries, but no one else got killed once we got to the crash site. So that certainly, in a hypothetical sense, would have been my most difficult decision. So putting that to the side, I'll say that every decision you make, whether it's in combat, whether you're running an organization in the commercial sector, whether you're leading your military unit in a training exercise, they all have the potential to be life and death decisions. Some obviously more than others, but every decision you make has a ripple effect and it affects people sometimes in a very profound and even existential manner. So you always have to be thinking about what are the effects of the decision that you're going to make. And the more you grow and mature as a leader, the more experience you get, the more comfortable you are with making those decisions. And even though they may seem somewhat intuitive because you no longer have to put the same degree of thought into them, they're still who you are. And, and, and you do owe your subordinates that degree of thought to where you give them a well thought out decision, understanding it could literally be life and death. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, thank you. Um, my next question uh, from the audience is, what advice can you give for newly commissioning lieutenants? You just talked about a lot of decisions and how to make decisions in tough scenarios, but um, what advice can you give for newly commissioning lieutenants who are just joining the Air Force and look, having followers looking uh, for their leadership? So one good piece of advice is if you videotape a presentation and come back weeks later for a Q&A, don't wear the same shirt because it makes it look like you only own one shirt. Trust me, I own a good three or four of them. So I, I think for a newly commissioned lieutenant is just immerse yourself in the experience. You're only going to get to do it once. This is your first time out of the shoot. Live it for all you can. Grab, grab it and go with it. You're going to make some mistakes. That's why it's called trial and error. You're going to make some mistakes. People expect that. Uh, one of the most important things you can do is establish a good professional working relationship with your NCOs and give them the respect that they deserve. You will earn that in return. You have their respect by virtue of the rank you wear, but you need to earn the personal respect that they'll give you. So don't get caught up in, oh, my boss made a dumb decision or uh, the bureaucracy is not cooperating with me or, you know, woe is me. Don't fall prey to any of that kind of silliness. Go for the gusto. You, you're going to, you, you have life by the horns. Go with it. Run with it. 
whether you're a pilot or, or whatever career path you choose, you only get one first time out of the blocks. So enjoy it, learn from it, use all the all the skills and experience you got here at the Air Force Academy to your advantage. Develop the relationship with your NCOs and, and run full speed ahead because your job will require that anyway, so you might as well stay one step in front of it. Sir, as a follow-up to that question, um, can you provide any examples uh, early in your career um, or any lessons that you learned very early on in your career in the Army uh, that could help uh, lieutenants uh, that are being newly commissioned? Yeah, I, I could fill volumes with the lessons learned from my career, mostly based on making mistakes. So you're going to have a boss. Listen to your boss. Part of your boss's responsibility is to grow you as a leader and to mentor you, whether it's a superb boss or one that you hope you don't work for again, you're going to have the opportunity to learn a lot. Same thing for your NCOs. I discussed that a little bit earlier. You can learn every single day from your NCOs. And, and in all walks of life, you'll have some who are truly extraordinary and some who may be struggling a bit, but you can learn from them all. Give them the respect that they have already earned, that they deserve. Uh, you can also learn from the lowest ranking people in your organization. You can learn from everybody. So that goes back to what I said about be visible. Go out and have open two-way communications. To the extent possible, develop a professional library. There are all sorts, there are literally thousands of good selections to choose from. You'll never be able to read them all in, in your lifetime. And as you start out, you're not going to have a lot of time for reading. But set some time aside for your professional development library. Read it. Learn from it. Ask your boss what he recommends. Ask your NCOs what they recommend. Ask your peers what they recommend, what they're currently reading. There's, a, there's too many choices for you to ever be able to get them all. But you, you'll find out some authors that, that you prefer over others. You'll find some genres you prefer over others. You can learn from virtually everything. So um, learn, read, never stop learning, never stop interacting with people. And not just your subordinates, your, your peers are a very important aspect of your professional growth and development because they're making some of the same mistakes you are and can prevent you from doing the same thing, the same wrong thing that they just did. So, you know, back to the previous question, it's an exciting time in your life. You're, you're going to go for a full out sprint and at times it's going to be exhausting and you're going to be sleep deprived and you're going to wonder why there aren't enough hours in the day. But it's an exhilarating ride, so hang on and go for it. Awesome, sir. Thank you. Shifting gears now back to um, the events in Somalia in 93, how were you able to keep a clear head in mind while being in such a stressful situation? And can you describe uh, what was what enabled you to make good decisions and clear decisions for your team in the heat of the moment? I, yeah, I think part of it was I had no choice. I, I understood the magnitude of what I was doing and the fact that I did have to make good decisions. But I was also surrounded by extraordinarily good soldiers. That that makes it very easy to make a good decision. I was also probably the oldest guy out there. I was a 40-year-old lieutenant colonel. So while you typically don't walk point for an infantry company in, in that situation, you do what has to be done. So with that much experience under my belt, I, I had, you know, since I was 17 years old going to West Point, I had been taught how to lead and how to make decisions. And I had learned the hard way in many cases, and I'd done a lot of trial and error. So at this point in my life, this was not my first deployment. And I, I was, like I said, surrounded by exceptionally good people. So the big thing is don't let yourself get excited and get carried away by the moment. Just stay calm, and everyone has their own technique for doing that. I can't sit here and, and tell a number of unseen faces how to stay calm and how to make good decisions. I can tell you that you can find your own techniques for that. And as you go along, it's a pretty smart system when you think about it. You start out at a junior grade, and you put the work in, and you put the years in, 
and you go to a higher grade and subsequently higher grade with more and more responsibility. You don't start out at the top. Like, you know, in some businesses, you'll find the son and daughter of the owner of the company are suddenly the, the CEO. They've had no training experience, and genetics just doesn't do the trick for you in that case. So the military is pretty smart when it comes to that. So the more experience you get under your belt, the more decisions you've, been, you've made, the more comfortable you are with the decision-making process. Sir, you talked about the worry ethos involved in making decisions like that and keeping a clear head so far. But can you describe uh, a little more how on the civilian side in a leadership position, what is the best way to apply warrior ethos? Like especially um, paralleling to the example of never leave a fallen comrade behind. Can you think of any situations in your civilian career that you can point to? Yeah, I've, I've actually encountered several situations, and, and I alluded to that in the uh, pre-recorded talk that we just showed. To me, a fallen comrade obviously means KIA on the battlefield, and we know what to do about that. But if you look around you and, and think back to some previous experiences in life, you've seen comrades who were in the process of falling. It could be relationship issues or, or issues at home or issues with alcohol or, or substance abuse, any number of things that they're falling and they need a hand. They need a hand to steady them. They need a hand to keep them from falling any further and they need a hand to lift them back up and, and get on the right path. So to the extent that you're able to be that person that never leaves a fallen comrade, that's the person that you want to be. And, I, and I've encountered that a number of times, both in the military and in the business world. Uh, you know, our lives don't always go according to plan. Life always intervenes. And, and people get a vote, and, and as in today, the weather gets a vote. There's always something coming in that, that can uh, knock your plan off course. So knowing that there are people in your life that can help you up when you're falling or have fallen, that's very critical. And I think it's also important for you as, as a leader to be known as that person who will never leave a fallen comrade, not just in the literal sense on the battlefield, but in the figurative sense in, in life in general. Thank you so much, sir. Um, switching back to the military side of uh, growing in different positions, uh, can you give any advice on giving and receiving feedback from the position of a commander and also seeking uh, reflection and self-awareness? Do you have any tips or tricks to that? Yeah, uh, nothing particularly tricky about it. Some things are built into the system, like when you get a mission order to do the planning, you give a brief back to the commander. In some place they call it back brief, uh, and I'm not entirely sure what you call it in the Air Force, but basically you sit down with the boss and say, okay, here, here's the job we've been given. Here's how we propose we do it. And sometimes that's in the form of a course of action brief where you present the boss with multiple courses of action. And then the boss will either pick one or say, you know what, let's do a hybrid of course of action one and three. Or I don't like any of the stuff you've done. Go away and come back with something smarter. So you have that formal brief back. And then you have, after you've gone out and done the job, you have the, the hot wash, the after action review, whatever you call it. And those, those are absolutely critical. Both those, the brief back and the hot wash are critical because a lot of times when you do something really well, you think that you're brilliant and, and everything went right because of your extraordinary planning and execution. Sometimes it's just luck, face it. Just like sometimes you have bad luck and all the best planning in the world wouldn't account for that. But make sure you go back and capture those things you did right as well as address the things you did wrong. And a lot of people, I don't know if it's human nature or just laziness, that we tend not to do that. We tend to pat ourselves on the back when it goes right, but then not capture it and institutionalize it to make sure that we always do those things in the future. So that's the formal aspect, the, the brief back and the hot wash. And then of course there's you know, the formal written after action report that you can go back and refer to in the future when you're getting ready to do something of a similar nature. On the informal side, and that, I think that the informal is probably about 90% of it. It's the interactions you have with your boss. Sometimes, hey, I want to see you, I want to see you in my office at uh, 1,600 hours. And then, you, you know, your first question is, am I in trouble? 
So the interaction with the boss, the interaction with your peers, the interaction with your subordinates, the interaction with the higher elements of the chain of command, interaction with people actually outside of the organization, but have good things for you to, to take a look at and what you can learn from them. It's up to you to take advantage of those opportunities and, and to go out and solicit input. Uh, very rarely is someone going to come and just give you some feedback, either positive or negative, uh, unless you're married to them, then they can't wait to give you feedback. But make it part of the way you do business. Just make it part of your toolkit to go out and solicit that feedback. Make sure you, you're doing things the way you think they're supposed to be done, but that may not be the way that they're actually supposed to be done. So there's a saying I really like that, I don't know what I told you until you told me what you heard. So you may think that you just gave the most brilliant set of instructions ever, um, but your subordinates are going away and they can't wait to get out of, away from you so they can say, okay, what did he really say? What did he really mean? So clear, open, two-way communications. And again, the informal is probably 90% or more of that feedback loop, but it's incumbent upon you to go out and solicit that feedback. Kind of long-winded. I hope I answered the question. Absolutely, sir. Thank you for that. Um, so we just talked about self-reflection and realizing how to take feedback and give it. But do you have any uh, anything that you wish your platoon sergeant would have taught you or helped you when you were a young platoon leader? You know, I, my first platoon sergeant was absolutely exceptional. He was a Vietnam veteran and spent a lot of time over there. Uh, he was he was going to retire as a sergeant first class E7. Um, should have been a command sergeant major, but the system doesn't always work to perfection. And I remember a day when I must have been particularly frazzled as a second lieutenant, you know, running in six directions simultaneously all as fast as I could. He got me in his pickup truck and, and drove off post to a coffee shop and uh, ordered a couple donuts and we sat there and ate a donut and drank coffee. And it occurred to me about halfway through that session that he probably didn't think I, and I looked like I was starving or really needed a drink. He knew that I needed a time to just take a tactical pause, stop, take a breath, regroup, and drive on from there. That was such a valuable lesson for me because every individual and organization at some point in time needs to take a tactical pause. If you're headed in the wrong direction, if you're not sure if you're headed in the right direction, if you have an individual that you see is, is getting kind of frazzled, take that tactical pause. That, that was one of the best things that Sergeant First Class Burnett ever left with me. Awesome. That's, that's a great story, sir. Um, what is your best approach uh, to dealing with leaders, however, when they don't necessarily make a decision you agree with. How can you best react as a subordinate um, to best uh, complete the mission at the same uh, level of success? Well, the first response is yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. And, and, you know, acknowledging the fact that you are my boss and you've given me a task and I will perform it. Uh, however, could we consider this? Have you thought of that? And it, to me, it's the responsibility of the subordinate to do what they can to adapt their style to the leader. The, the leader, particularly the higher up you go, can't adapt their style to four, five hundred, three thousand subordinates. It's impossible. So a good leader remains flexible, knows their subordinates, and knows how to interact with each one. But a good subordinate, a subordinate leader, is also a good follower. Those two concepts are, are completely intertwined. You can't have one without the other. So first response, got it boss, will do. Um, what is the possibility of attacking it from this angle instead of that angle? And part of it is a situation. If you're taking ground fire from different locations, that's not the time to discuss anything. It's certainly not the time to, to stop and have a debate. It's the time to say, I hear and I obey. But if you're in a meeting room and, and it's nothing urgent and you know that there's a better way to do it, then hopefully you have a boss with an open mind that's open to different input that will solicit that different input. And even if they don't, 
it's still your duty to provide them that different input. And then maybe you get shot in the face, maybe you don't. But you would be derelict in your duty if you didn't bring up a better way to do something than what the boss proposed. Awesome. Sir, continuing on that uh, kind of balance between leadership and followership, as officers, what is the best way um, to really keep that balance and understanding how to really interact from both roles within the chain of command? Uh, well, that's that's true for everyone in uniform, officer, non-commissioned officer, warrant officer, junior enlisted ranks, you name it. We're all followers to some degree or another. Um, the the chairman of the joint staff of the joint chiefs of staff takes his orders from the president and from the secretary of defense. So no matter how high up you go, you're still a follower to some degree or another. And, and to me, a good leader has a full understanding of that. Uh, a good leader doesn't get wrapped up in their ego about, wow, look how high up the food chain I am. A good leader actively solicits input from everyone throughout the chain of command, superiors, peers, subordinates. Uh, and I, I told a group earlier that if the job is digging a foxhole, you can have a room full of generals sitting around discussing the best way to do it, but I'm going to go find the two privates out there with a shovel in their hand. They're the ones who will really have the best input on how to dig a foxhole. So part of being a good leader slash follower is open to that input, so actively soliciting that input, and understanding the fact that you have to do both at once, be a leader and a follower. Absolutely. Sir, if you were the one who is in a position in which you are failing in a certain way, if you are starting to fall or deal with other things in life, we've talked already about how we can really address and help others in a situation by leading from example and leaving no man behind. But how can you deal personally with your own issues if you're the one who's failing to succeed in a certain situation? Yeah, that's a great question and something that uh, when I was younger, I did not do a good job of going and telling someone I need help or soliciting the input on, uh, hey, let me know if I'm screwing this up. I think part of that may have been pride and ego and part of it was just uh, good old fashioned stupidity. I just wasn't smart enough to do that. So fortunately, time goes by and you live and you learn. So be willing to put it out there. Don't, don't walk around with an ego. It's just not healthy. Be as humble as you possibly can. Be ready to ask someone for help. And if you've done a good job of developing the relationships with your subordinates, with your NCOs, with your peers, with your superiors, then they know that you're approachable. They know that you've been out there practicing good open two-way communications so that they don't feel at all uncomfortable offering you whatever advice they think you may need. Similarly, you don't feel at all awkward or uncomfortable going to them for their input or asking for help. So it's just a matter of being a humble leader, being ready to take whatever someone gives you now, that doesn't mean you blindly follow what everyone says because then you'll get nowhere because you're going to get conflicting advice. But be open to that, always open. And that goes back to what I said about the open, clear communications. And it has to be two-way. Sir, thank you again for all of the answers you've provided thus far. We have time for one more question um, before we conclude. Uh, so real quickly, how do you get over the fear of making mistakes? You've talked of how it's normal to make mistakes, but how do we really rationalize and get around the, uh, the physical fear of making them? Yeah, and, and nobody likes to make a mistake, but I think as a leader, you're, you're always out there. You're always on. You're always making decisions. So part of that is the understanding that I'm probably not going to be perfect. I'm going to strive for perfection, but I will make mistakes. So that's kind of a good wrap-up question because if you built in those techniques that I talked about with having a brief back, doing hot washes, having the open two-way communications, then that fear of making a mistake 
tends to just dissipate, or, or at least if it doesn't completely go away, it goes into the background because you're out there. People are are saying when you when you're standing up in front of the hot wash as the overall boss, um, hey boss, you screwed this up, you screwed that up. I love the comments that the soup made this morning, particularly with his his last story about going into the DV lounge. Uh, he looked back. He wishes he could have a do-over on that. He wishes he didn't do that, but he you know. He understood that uh, he let the people down. They were they were now his subordinates, even though it was totally de facto. It was an airplane roster, people he'd never seen before. But it takes a great leader to stand up there and say, here's what I screwed up. So if you do that during a hot wash when you're the boss, that sets a tone for everyone to know that, hey, no one's above criticism. If the boss can stand up there and tell us what he did to screw up, and just as importantly, how to make sure that doesn't happen in the future, then I can't be thin-skinned if someone points out something I did wrong, and I can certainly stand up and acknowledge that I did something wrong. So it uh, goes back to the comments earlier about how, how you start out small and, and get more and more responsibility as time goes by. The more you do, the more mistakes you're going to make. But the fewer the ratio of mistakes to good decisions because you get better at it as time goes on. And you'll still make the occasional error, but because you've got that good open two-way communication, because you've got the brief backs and the hot washes and the informal network in place, you'll find out about it. You'll know about it if you didn't already know about it yourself. You'll acknowledge it, you'll own it, and you'll figure out how to not let it happen again. Sir, thank you again for your time today. We appreciate your willingness to really share your perspectives with us and your unique background that you brought uh, to NCLS this year, uh, with our, especially with our focus on warrior ethos um, and what it means to us as cadets and future Air Force and Space Force officers. Um, as a token of our appreciation, a commemorative plaque will be on its way to you. Uh, we thank you again and hope you remind, uh, you're reminded of your time here with us this weekend uh, and you look back on this uh, experience fondly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this NCLS session. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody.